Hey, fellow Mathers, before we get into this episode, we want to share with you how you can get access to free content, professional learning that will keep your students engaged and doing the math that matters. Get ready to go to this link, mathisfigureoutable.com slash challenge. That's right. Registration is open for the free Math is Figure Outable challenge that's starting May 15th and runs to the 17th at 7 p.m. Central. We're going to have three nights jam-packed with learning and routines that you can take straight to your classroom. In these challenges, we have a great time. We do some math, talk about classroom experiences, give away super cool bonuses and prizes. You won't just walk away with routines that are naturally engaging and encourage your students to think mathematically. You'll also have a chance to win over 6 k worth in prizes, including a few virtual PD sessions for your school. I'll be joined by my wonderful co-host, Kim, and special guest, Jenna Laib. You can register at mathisfigureoutable.com slash challenge for a fantastic learning experience. That's mathisfigureoutable.com slash challenge. Now on to the show. Hey, fellow mathematicians. Welcome to the podcast where math is figure outable. I'm Pam Harris. And I'm Kim. And you found a place where math is not about memorizing and mimicking, waiting to be told or shown what to do. But y'all, it's about making sense of problems, noticing patterns, and reasoning using mathematical relationships. We believe we can mentor students to think and reason like mathematicians. Not only are algorithms not particularly helpful in teaching mathematics, but rotely repeating steps actually keep students from being the mathematicians they can be. Hey, Pam. So we got a comment from a journey leader recently. Um, You you know her, Susan Mm -hmm. Smith. Ah, yes. Uh, Uh uh And she actually said, I heard an interview with Peter in which he talked about number talks or jump starts or problem strings and how they could be a whole class portion followed by a rich task at vertical boards. And she said uh, she's been doing 10 minute problem strings as a class. And then she introduces rich tasks at a vertical board, board for the majority of the class time. And then she says, She's ending with consolidation and the strategies it learned in number strings are highlighted when they naturally appeared and used in tasks by students. Nice. Which is really what we talked about in the last episode. We kind of suggested that uh, we like a lot of what Peter Lilly et al. says in Building Thinking Classrooms, but that we wouldn't suggest that problem strings, so Susan, they're called problem strings, not number strings. <laughs> fine, that problem strings are not, um, the ones I write especially, are not intended to be at vertical spaces. They're intended to be whole group, uh, just like she said, whole group conversations. Um, And then after you've done a problem string, send the kids to those vertical non-permanent surfaces and do those rich tasks. And then you might consider that a follow-up to that rich task could also be a problem string to cinch something that happened in that rich task. So you could actually change up your your order a little bit and start the day with the rich task at the vertical non-permanent surfaces, consolidate, and then we we would call that a math congress, um, and then uh, finish it with a problem string to kind of cinch something that came out um, in that rich task. So yeah, Susan, that's great and super cool to hear uh, that Peter's starting to talk about that too. He's a great guy. I mean, one of the things that I think he's proven over and over again is that he listens to teachers and that he is you know, super Mm -hmm. thoughtful and he goes with the evidence. And so if he's finding that people are having success with that and he's starting to talk about it, so do we. And so that's awesome. I think we agree there. Cool. In, in the last episode, Kim, we, we kind of focused last two episodes, we kind of focused on part one of his four part set of 14 teaching practices. Um, Today, Kim, let's focus um, more on part two, Um, at least some of the parts. I think, I think we focused on part one, we talked about kind of all of the parts. In part two, we're just going to focus on a couple of things that we um, find really uh, noteworthy. So Mm -hmm. in part two, one of the things that he says is to answer only keep thinking questions. What's that all about? Yeah. And well, so it's super interesting because teachers, we talk like all the time, right? We're talking, talking, talking. And one of the things that Lily et al. says is that he came to the startling conclusion that a typical teacher will answer between 200 and 400 questions in a day. That's probably not surprising (laughs) to many of us. Um, With with some people answering as many as 600, 600 questions. No wonder we're tired. The problem (laughs) is 
that with answering all these questions and it's antithetical to the goal of getting students to think, right? So it's interesting because we're teachers and we answer questions and we want to be helpful. I was going to say, um, I mean, we're helpful, right? Teachers, we, yeah. of, cor- would, of course, we're going to answer student questions. How, th- that would be mean yeah. not to answer their questions. Yeah. Well, or... so this actually made me think about kind of the stage of parenting I am right now, where it's oh. lots of guiding. And so I'm like giving kind of instructions and teaching lots of things, but they ask a bunch of questions. And and sometimes we need to just like set them forth and like try and maybe fail a little bit. Um, if I direct every single move and every single thing that they do, are they really learning anything? So, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. you know, we've heard teachers say, well, my kids before you go back this. to teaching, if, if, before yeah. you go back to teaching, if I may, I'm, um, you know, my kids are older than yours and yeah. they're adults now. And, um, looking back, I wish I maybe was a little bit less of a helicopter parent, a little, I, I wish I would have answered a few less questions. Yeah. Like I can see more clearly now the benefit in having my kids, um, feel empowered to fail early yeah. rather than get a little older before they start taking risks. And right. then the, <laughs> let's be clear, then the fails are bigger. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they're, they're, don't hear me, hear me right. They're doing great. Yeah. But it, it, in hindsight, I see the value and the wisdom in, I, we're saying fail. It's not like we're going to leave kids hanging, right? right? It's not like we're going to hang over the precipice. And they're going to, not that, but, um, but be okay but yeah. trying things, not knowing, Wait, say that again? but be, being okay with trying things, mm-hmm. not knowing the, mm-hmm. the exact outcome. So we hear this a lot with teachers who say, my kids can't do this thing that you're talking about. They, they, you know, they can't think and they can't, um, uh, yeah, Pam, you don't understand my kids, my kids, my kids, they they, they can't. And and working memory. Yeah. But sometimes Mm -hmm. when they describe the classroom dynamic, um, looking from the outside, we can see that they're directing every move and they're not giving the space for their kids to even attempt to think we're doing it all for them. Mm-hmm. Which is it's tricky and subtle, right? Like we're not trying to be ornery. Um, I, th- there's this thing about uh, about the the balance maybe between how helpful we are, or at least how helpful we think we're being, versus how helpful we can be when we actually empower students to think. And I don't think it's um, uh, I don't know. It's it's trivial. It's not. I don't think. I don't think it's trivial. What? Where's the line? What's the balance? So let's talk about that today. Like, and I think. I think Peter gets helpful with that, uh, Dr. Lily at all in his Building Thinking Classroom book, because he identifies three main types of questions that students ask. And he then suggests that we focus and, uh, and only really answer one of those types. So three types of questions. One of them is proximity questions. Those are kinds of questions that, that students only ask when you're in proximity. So when you are close to them, then those questions get asked. Stop thinking questions is what he calls this next a uh, set of questions. And it's, it's cute that he, or cute, I don't know. It's, it, it, it's well named that he calls them stop thinking questions because he's suggesting this category of questions actually stop students right. thinking. And so of course we don't want to answer those. So don't answer questions. If they're just proximity questions, don't answer questions. If they're just stop thinking questions. And then he says, there's a third kind keep thinking mm-hmm. questions. So let's dive into these, these three types a little bit more, Kim. Yeah. So proximity questions, uh, you and I have actually um, talked about it a little bit before because we recognize mm-hmm. that this happens. And so we we kind of jokingly say, get in, get out, right? Get in to the situation, <laughs> mm-hmm. say the thing, give directions, do you know whatever you're attempting to communicate with your students and then leave, get out. We don't want to hang out you know, in a small group for too long when we go visit with kids because what we hear are things like, do we have to learn this? Is this going to be on the test? Is this right? Um, and, and those aren't furthering the math in any way. They're just saying it because you happen to be standing right beside them. So I Mm -hmm. I have a couple of Mm -hmm. other, um, uh, quotes from the book. It says, these questions are motivated by the reality that for students thinking is difficult and it's hard to decide for themselves that what they're doing is correct. If they can just get you to do that for them, their life would be so much easier. So students ask questions with the hope that you will answer it and they can stop thinking. And and let's be clear, it is easier right. not to think. Right. Um, where was I just? 
I just, was it when we were building, uh, excuse me, when it, was it when we were filming Building Powerful Fractions when a teacher said, oh, I love what we're doing, Pam. This yeah, is so much yeah. easier. And I paused and I was like, uh-huh. don't say that. <laughs> what you mean is it's so much more figure outable. And the teacher kind of thought for a second and was like, yeah, that is actually what I mean. It's not easier. Like my brain's right. really working hard, but whoa, it's like so figure outable. So there's a difference between <clears throat> like things being figure outable and therefore you feel like it's doable. That's brilliant. We want to really advocate that. But thinking, I, you know, like really diving in and fussing and fumbling and, and grappling, that's probably the best word I want to use there, grappling with relationships, grappling with what's happening so that then working out and making sense of, yeah, that's yeah. hard work, right? And so, yeah, he, he's, he's suggesting that uh, when when you are in proximity, when the teacher is nearby and the student looks up right. and is like, oh, right. hey, save me. Is this right? And then if the teacher goes, oh, yeah, or or no, no, like that one, yep. or ooh, not add, subtract, or uh, the, the number up there. Like as soon as the teacher dives into, mm-hmm. quote unquote, help, bam, that, yeah, that's absolutely easier. And then the student is doing less thinking. So if we're trying to build a thinking classroom, which we are, I think we might maybe say we want to build a reasoning classroom. Not, not to say that thinking's not right, but maybe I would add reasoning. I and mean, we've been talking about that for a long time, that absolutely uh, those proximity questions. Yeah. And I, I think there's kind of a connection between the stop thinking and the proximity questions, because they, if you're there, they're going to ask you something. And typically it's in order to stop their thinking. So here's another quote. It says, What's important is that you do not answer stop thinking or proximity questions and that you read the situation. I love that. You read the situation so as to be able to give the best response when such questions are asked. Right. That's, I know why you like I that do. so much. Read the situation because you are the, the, the one who said, know your content, know your kids. Right. right? So does, is that yeah, what you're absolutely. thinking right there? Read absolutely. the situation uh-huh. means know your yep. kids. Yeah. So like, what do you mean by that? Like if, if I were, if, if, if you walk up to a group of kids and they're asking either a stop thinking or a proximity question and, and how does that know your kids? How does that impact how you might handle that? Well, situation? I mean, if we know our students and we know kind of what their hang up is, I, I'm not going to answer questions because I happen to be there that stops their thinking about the math. But if I have a student that is not going to move forward because they're not understanding something, I'm absolutely going to answer that for them. If I, if it's a clarifying question, for sure. You don't mean math no. though, right? Right there. You mean right. like instructions right. or yep. like their role yep. at the moment, um, if they're supposed to be writing on yep. paper or not. In other words, know your kid. I can picture the kid who's kind of like fussing around to do anything but dig into the work. And when I walk by, they might go, hey, are we supposed to, are we supposed to put this in our notebook? Is this supposed to be that kind of a question? Is a kid trying right. to just waste time? But if I walk by either, now I'm going to make a guess here so you can correct me, either your oldest or yeah. my second, and they say, hey, yeah. is this supposed to go in the notebook? Then I would absolutely answer right. that question because that kid, right. it's a real question for that kid. It's not a, it's not a time waster. And, and, um, yeah, I just know and, our kids. Yes, absolutely. And, Did I guess and that right? what will happen is the time will be wasted because they're so focused on that question that then they won't move on. They will absolutely sit there thinking about it, wondering mm-hmm. about it, worrying mm-hmm. about it. And if the goal is to maximize the amount of thinking and reasoning time in the classroom, I'm going to answer that question to get them back into the map. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So not, 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 you're not going to leave. How do I say this? You're not going to answer a mathematical question to starve them or, or keep them from the learning of the math, but you are going to answer a procedural kind of Yes, you're supposed to be in your vertical non-permanent surface uh, randomly chosen group right now. Or uh, yes, yeah. uh, we're working on this problem right now. Or, you know, like those kinds of let's keep you doing the work questions. Right. If you know the student and that that student's not just popping it off to waste time, then you would absolutely do that. Can you think of any other examples of um, times that you would know your student and so it would impact hmm, whether you would answer you. a question like that? Yeah, so am I. I thought I had an example when I was thinking this the other day. Now I can't come up with it. I mean, it's so interesting because right now I can picture specific kids' faces in my in my mind, you know? Like the kid the kids that um mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know that I have a specific example. I'm sure I will as soon as we're done talking. <laughs> yeah, we'll keep thinking about it. <laughs> 
Well, and part of maybe what's hard for both of us right now is we don't, uh, we, we early, quickly, we develop a thinking classroom. We develop a reasoning community of, of, of mathematicians. Yeah. So we don't get a lot of stop thinking questions. So if a kid asks a question that might be quoted here as a stop thinking question, then we're going to probably know yeah. that it's not a time waster and that we're actually going to, you know, dive in and answer it yeah, um, to keep sure. that, that student um, you want to hear um, going. Interesting? Right. Does that make sense? So um, in his book, he suggests that 90% of those hundreds and hundreds of questions are proximity or stop thinking questions. Whoa, that's a high, that's 90%. A high, uh-huh, uh-huh. So let's talk about the other one. Okay. So if we're not going to answer stop thinking questions and we're not going to answer proximity questions, um, either of those, unless we know the kid, then what are the other ones? He calls them keep thinking questions. Nice name that, you know, I, I like names that aren't just names for silly sake. Right. <laughs> that totally describes keep thinking questions. You know, it's funny. He doesn't actually say an, a, a lot about those um, in his book. And as you and I uh, have kind of been brainstorming what those keep thinking questions are, we think they're kind of the questions that are, uh, let, let me let me say it. If they're keep thinking questions, kids want their 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 they have. How do you say have dived in? Have dove in? They've dove in. They they dove in. That word in English. <laughs> they dove in. There we go. And and so yes, they're in yes. the math, and it's almost like they're wondering yeah. aloud. It's almost like they're saying things like, "Will that work all the time?" But they don't actually expect you to answer it. They're like right. wondering if it will work all the time. I, I, would that work with negative numbers? And they're looking at you not as if, again, when we've developed this this classroom atmosphere, this community of learners, not because they're expecting you to say yes or no. It's because they're like, I'm wondering yes. that. Wonder that yeah. with me. Right? It's it's like an invitation that the, the questions are more mathematical. What they're not is right. permission. Like, why are we learning this? Is this going to be on the test? Do I have to do this in my notebook? Is this going to... Do we have homework tonight? Like all of those kind of sort of mm-hmm. like procedural permission questions. He suggests with those, yeah. just smile well, and, and walk and away. In, <laughs> in this section where he talks about keeping thinking questions, he does um, mention a few that feel kind of permission-based to me, but it's permission-based about, can I go further? And I suspect mm. that what we've seen is true and that the more that you create a situation where it's a thinking classroom, the kids aren't really asking permission to do that. They know that they can. And so as you get further into the year, they stop asking permission to go deeper because you've already established that that's what you're okay with. They can ask themselves questions. They can dig deeper into what's happening. So there, it's less permission, can you? And then it's this wondering yeah. aloud that you're talking about. So I think I think Peter would agree with you. I think he said something about... Um that that when you've developed the thinking classroom, I think he actually said something, students will eventually stop asking those oh, kinds of, that. Yeah, can we go cool. further, deeper kinds of questions because they will, yeah, they will have built in themselves the confidence to to know, yeah, that is what we do here. Like yeah. what we do here is go deeper, further, wonder, um, pursue the questions that we have uh, yep. and, and see, see what sense we can make of the yeah. math, right? Because that's, that's the whole situation that we're working on. Yeah, nice. So, I mean, I think it's really cool that you can envision a situation where the kids are, you know, if, if you're ignoring proximity questions and you're not answering those and you're not answering stop thinking questions and they the keep thinking questions kind of go away from questioning and more wondering. I mean, what, a, what a great atmosphere where kids might be calling you over, but it's to share generalizations or things that they've learned. And it's, it's less asking and more here's what we've discovered. Here's what we figured out. It's pretty cool. Yeah. And maybe, maybe even still, and here's what we're yes. wondering. Right. 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 But yeah, it's less absolutely. asking yeah. you to solve that for them. Right. And more, absolutely. More, I, I yeah. want to continue this. Yeah. So he suggests um, some things to do. And mm-hmm. one is that Peter suggests that you can tell students about the three types of questions, which I, which I yeah, find really yeah. interesting. And, and to be clear. Yeah. Um, as I was reading that part, I, I found it noteworthy that he said, but maybe don't do it right. first. Like don't front load, hey, I'm about to do, I'm, I'm about to only answer these questions. Maybe start only answering the questions. And then when students start like, wait, what's going on? Then you can be like, oh yeah, let yeah. me explain what's happening. 
um, I thought that was kind of interesting. He, he lists some reasons why um, that, that, that if you do it at the front, it's almost like you're telling their students will hear you saying, right. so therefore behave. And then they'll be like, oh, what if I don't want to behave? Um, and so instead of doing it that way, like he, he does say it can be helpful to, uh, and I think there are, again, know your kids. I think there are some students who it might be helpful sooner than later. You know, um, I can picture some kids maybe on the spectrum or that it will stop their thinking to to have something shift. They went, wait, this is different than it's been. Like, help me out here. Um, but but to start kind of doing uh, only answering keep thinking questions and not answering the proximity yeah. and stop asking questions, stop thinking questions, do that first for a while and then say to them, oh, you might have noticed and let me tell you what's happening. And then students don't um, maybe react poorly uh, in that case. So how how you tell them seem to matter a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's funny because I actually, uh, with my oldest last night, said, oh, you're only asking me because I'm standing here. And I walked away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. And you know, I can do that because it's my kid, but um, there's, there's so many applications. Okay. So three strategies. One, when you say you can only do that because it's your kid, I think you can say that very same thing when you know the students. Yeah. Maybe I think that, if, yeah. if a student says something that's it's just to kind of look like they're engaged. I mean, we all know those students that will ask as soon as you walk by, they do something to look like they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. I think in that moment you can go, look, I saw what you were, you know, you were on your phone playing around. Like, like don't, you, you can't hide it from me. <laughs> no, I'm not going to answer that question because you're just, you're only asking it because, because I'm here and you're trying to look like you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. How about if you actually do what you're supposed to be doing in a polite way, you would say that in a polite way, right? Yeah. But again, know your kids. Yep. Yeah. So three strategies. One, reduce proximity during the first three to four minutes of the task. That's when lots of proximity questions happen. So as we said earlier, get in, get out, um, and just don't be around for those questions. Um, another really good strategy is don't answer any questions from individuals. Oh yeah, I thought yeah, this was it, a good if one. If an individual comes back, then you redirect them back to the group and 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 ask what what did your group decide? What did your group say? And then individuals ask the group, and then the group can ask the teacher. Found that interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's then, a nice and one. And then probably like my favorite lot. is lead with your own questions. Um, and this is exactly something that we do when we're, you know, in a rich task and circulating with small groups. Instead of just walking up and, li- you know, listening, we do listen in, but usually we walk in with our question rather than just wait for them to bombard us with questions. Yeah, I have seen you do this very thing where you'll walk up to a group, but they don't notice you yet. And you'll look at what's on their uh, vertical non-permanent surface. And you'll kind of like then walk up and go, oh, I'm really interested in this. Could you guys tell me about this? Like, What's happening here? What's this thinking going on here? I've totally seen you do that. Yeah. I, when I read that, I was like, oh yeah, we do that. We, we absolutely walk in with something that we're going to ask them about. Tell me about your thinking here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, something that you mentioned earlier um, that I'm going to mention again is that he also says to smile and walk away. And, mm-hmm. and, I, and we have a little bit of a different take on that, right? Will you, will you share about that? So we would say, um, I, and, and I, I think we would kind of agree with the smile and walk mm-hmm. away, but we would add to that maybe that often a super good response to any question from students is a very neutral response. Whether it is a question from students or a response, like if, uh, if the students, you know, you walk up and they say, hey, is this right? Or look what we did here. I, I might be inclined or teacher might be inclined to be super helpful and go, yeah, yeah, that's really right. Or, oh, no, we need to work on that. That's wrong. Or, or mm, and, you know, with that, that look of like, <laughs> the, the look where kids are clearly like, oh, dear, it's wrong. We like a neutral response. We like to go, you think? Tell me more about that. I mean, um, I'm going to interrupt you real quick uh, because my favorite thing that I see you do oh, yeah. um, in workshops and when you're working with teachers and students is a student will say, I, I think it's 13. And almost immediately you say, you think it's 13. And they're like, uh-huh. Even if they don't yeah. say, I think it's 13. Even if they say, you know, like, hey, so-and-so, what did you get for that one? And they're like, 43. I'll go, so, uh, bleh, I'll say, uh-huh. you think it's 43. Yep. And I'll write 43 on the board. And then sometimes yeah. like, did anybody get another answer? So this sort of mm-hmm. real neutral response, we we love that. We have whole video montages of different teachers where the response is just this 
kind of neutral or, or, or super interested, kind of a concentrated look like, Oh, you think it's 43? You think, you, you think it's 50? You think the line is Y equals X plus two, like whatever, whatever it is. Oh, that, that, that's mm-hmm. okay. That's what you're thinking. It's, it's this response back of not right, not wrong, yeah. but tell me more. Like I'm, I'm super interested. I'm curious. And, and I'll never forget when I said to you, Kim, how do you get kids to share their thinking and not just focus on the answer? And that day when you said, yeah. Pam, it's what you celebrate. And I was like, what do you mean by that? And you're like, it's what you talk about. So, so we just said, you know, 43. Oh, you think it's 43? How, did, how, why? Tell me more about that. Did anybody else think it's 43? How are you thinking? How did, and then the, then the rest of the conversation focuses not on the 43, but focuses on how you got the 43 or the Y equals X plus one or whatever the answer is that becomes a given. All right. We've all got the right answer now. Like what, tell me how, what are you thinking about what you celebrate? And if you celebrate the thinking, then students are going to dive in with their thinking and less, is this right? Is it wrong? Am I doing it correctly? Did I get the next step? What's the next step? Less of those stop thinking questions and more of, oh, what we do here, what we do here is think and reason and share that with everybody and then sharpen our thinking as we um, bounce it off of the rest of the class. Yeah. Yeah, actually. Um, is that what you were hoping so- I was going to share? One thing that we're hoping (laughs) the listeners um, think about are the kinds of questions that your students are asking so that you are only answering keep thinking questions. That's the goal. Yeah. And Kim, I will never forget the day when I was in a classroom of uh, uh, high school students and we were going to film the next day. And so we always go in that first day and we we make the name tense so I can pronounce their names correctly because names are super important. And, um, and we do a short problem string. So they kind of get a feel for what we're going to do on camera the next day. And I will never forget this group of high school students. I'm, I'm in the middle of the short problem string. It's not really a time to ask a question. This kid right in the middle of the room, second row, right in the middle of the room, raises his hand. And he says, and and I'm thinking in my head, it's not really time to ask a question, but okay, what do you got? And he goes, it's almost, (laughs) it's almost like you want us to use what we know to solve the problem. (laughs) <laughs> and what was super was the entire right. rest of the room was like, yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. So he didn't really, he didn't expect an answer from me, but I just smiled and said, uh-huh. Yep. Yep. I just, I just use what, you know, we had already in that short period of time started to build the community where he was like, huh, like here, my, the task here, the job here is to just use what, you know, okay. All right. I'm going to dive in and do that. Yeah. And then it's we no get good. thinking and reasoning classrooms. Super cool. Y'all, thank you for tuning in and teaching more and more real math. To find out more about the Math is Figure Outable movement, visit mathisfigureoutable.com. Let's keep spreading the word that math is figure outable. Thank you for listening and making math more figure outable. To learn even more, make sure you register for our free challenge at mathisfigureoutable.com slash challenge. You are not going to want to miss the evenings of May 15th through 17th, starting at 7 p.m. Central. Math teaching, math teaching, go register now. That's mathisfigureoutable.com slash challenge. Join us to make math more and more figure outable. And if you can't join live, register and we'll send you access to the recordings. We'll see you there.